what's up guys today i am in front of you with a new video for the question and answers from previous year question papers for the csi ir ugc net examination in earth sciences before starting i'd like to just give a piece of advice to everyone who is preparing for jrf in earth sciences there are several topics which are written in the syllabus according to me you need not study all of those if you want to do a smart work then apart from the general aptitude and general science you should focus on a few topics namely general geology when i say general geology it includes parts of solar system general uh, information about the earth and its formation and all in fact general geology covers the entire geology some ba very basic questions apart from that most importantly oceanography climatology these two are very very important topics and you should read in depth about them a few good books for example invitation to oceanography by pinet or uh, trusillo's book of oceanography they are excellent books and for climatology portion if you wish to study i will say there is only one book that is sufficient is the climatology by ds lal apart from that you should read in detail for about sedimentology for sedimentology you should you can go through morris and tucker or uh, you can use petty john and for the environment portion you can go through rainek and singh then geomorphology is a very very important topic lot of questions are asked from geomorphology and you can use any one good book for example geomorphology by thornbury it's a very very good book or richard selby's book of geomorphology selby's book of geomorphology is very nice and a few portions from uh, you know paleontology micro paleontology can be done apart from this if you cover these topics thoroughly and by heart i see no reason that you won't be selected for jrf the questions from geophysics or uh, geochemistry and uh, igneous and metamorphic petrology hydrogeology these are i would not recommend for particularly this examination okay so without much ado let us begin in this portion i'll be focusing mainly on oceanography and related parts but of course you will be getting a few questions from other portions as well so let us start here what does this say this question says which one of the following milankovitch periodicities in climate is due to the precession of the earth 41000 years 23000 years 100000 years or 10000 years and what would be the answer the answer would be 23000 years so those of you who know about the uh, milankovitch cycle we know that there are three types of milankovitch cycles the eccentricity the obliquity and the precession cycle so we have the eccentricity obliquity and precession so when i say eccentricity here you can see that in the eccentricity cycle you will be finding that earth's orbit which is elliptical so you can see here this is the earth's op orbit which is elliptical it goes from being less elliptical to more elliptical okay this is called as eccentricity so this is a cycle which takes about 100000 years second is the obliquity where the tilt of the earth changes so it is also called as obliquity cycle we all know that the earth's uh, tilt is 23 and a half degrees and it changes from 21 to 24 days changes between 21 to 24 degrees and it takes 41000 years and the third cycle is the precession cycle where the wobbling of the earth happens wobbling those of you who wish to know what is wobbling you must have seen a top top spinning top 
so when the top spins what does happen so let us say if this is the earth and right now this is the direction of the tilt of its axis so after this 20 kilo year or 23000 years the tilt will the tilt will turn this way okay we'll see in detail so the question was that precision of the earth so it is 23000 years i hope you understood these read about the milankovitch cycle in detail it uh, at least a question is asked for sure let us see the next question the benthic organism living at the deep ocean floor get oxygen due to weathering of oxide minerals at the sea floor submarine volcanic eruptions sinking of polar waters to the sea floor and decay of the organic matter at the sea floor the correct answer would be sinking of polar waters to the sea floor now if we go into the details of this process that how does the sinking of polar water bring oxygen to the deep sea because the benthic organisms which live in the deeper waters since there are no plants there will be no chance of photosynthesis so if photosynthesis isn't there then how the deep water is rich in oxygen to support the deep water life for this let us first understand how the deep water is formed so the deep ocean circulation it starts with the formation of of north atlantic deep water how does this happen so let us consider in the northern atlantic region where the temperatures are very very low the surface water of the sea it starts turning to ice as the water turns ice it rejects around 70 percent of the salt back to the ocean the phenomenon is known as brine rejection brine rejection so now what will happen the remaining sea water it becomes enriched in the salt content because 70 percent of the salt is sent back to the water as a result the density of water increases water becomes heavy and it starts to sink vertically down this is how north atlantic deep water or north atlantic bottom water is formed now since this water is in contact with the atmosphere so we can see here that oxygen sunlight or the heat from the atmosphere it is trapped in this uh, surface water when the surface water starts to sink then it brings with it oxygen and heat to the deep water portion so you can understand that the formation of north atlantic deep water is very important for the deep sea organisms and it is this north atlantic deep water formation which starts the deep ocean circulation so let us see what is deep ocean circulation i am sure you all must have uh, read about the great ocean conveyor belt sorry great ocean conveyor belt and in the great ocean conveyor belt you must have read about the sinking arm sinking arm and returning arm so the sinking arm is the one which starts from this Norwegian seas and here when the north atlantic deep water is formed it sinks to the bottom goes all across the global oceans to upwell in the northern pacific and then return back so this sinking arm is the one which carries oxygen for the benthic or the deep sea organisms okay let us move ahead mariana trench was formed due to divergence of oceanic plates divergence of oceanic and continental plates convergence of oceanic plates and convergence of continental plates so what would be the answer so if you are well versed with the plate tectonics then you first of all read this term trench so how is a trench formed a trench is formed when there is the 
convergence of oceanic plates so mariana trench it is formed when here we have the convergence of this mariana's plate beneath the pacific plate it's the deepest trench in the world you all know that so the convergence of the uh, oceanic plates has formed this has led to the formation of the mariana trench understood so you can see here how this uh, oceanic plate is converging or is colliding with the pacific plate and the pacific plate subducts leading to the formation of this mariana trench all right let us go ahead which of the following statements is true with regard to global precipitation during glacial interglacial periods in glacial periods there was more precipitation in glacial periods there was less precipitation precipitation remained the same in both the periods precipitation increased in polar area during glacial periods and we all know that the precipitation it needs warmth means higher temperature and high humidity which are lowered when the temperatures are low so in glacial period there was less precipitation this is a very common uh, thing to understand and this question is very easy question where you have to apply some logic and you will get the answer to you can't do really nothing much about it you should know that the glacial period they are uh, associated with lowered humidity okay all right now let us come to this question the rate of sediment accumulation is minimum at continental shelves continental slope continental rises deep ocean floor the answer to this question would be deep ocean floor let us see how when the so let, let me draw a diagram this is the ocean floor geometry so we have the ocean shelf the deep sea uh, uh, the uh, slope and we have this deep sea floor now let us consider that this is the sea water okay and this is the shoreline now whenever whenever the agent like a river it comes in then what does it do it brings with it lot of sediments but as the river meets the ocean near this shoreline its energy is reduced so what will happen now as it enters into the sea the energy of this carrying media starts to fade away as a result what does it do it leaves the coarsest fractions at the beach followed by finer fraction then more fine fraction and then we have the finest sediments in the open ocean so what is the question what does the question ask the rate of sediment accumulation so till the slope part shelf and slope part some content is carried by these waters and then as this gradient also increases then we will see the sediments they get accumulated at a faster rate over here but when we go towards the open ocean here the bathymetry is the highest and the sediment size is the lowest so this is the finest sediments here as a result they take very very long time to accumulate on the sea floor and therefore the sediment accumulation rate is lowest on the deep sea floor okay let us move ahead which one of the following tidal patterns characterizes the west coast of india one high and one low of equal magnitude one high and one low of unequal magnitude two highs and two lows of equal magnitude and two highs and two lows of unequal magnitude so what does this mean if we go uh, according to this uh, statement then this is a sorry this is a diurnal tide 
and these two they are kind of semi diurnal tides but specifically this is a semi diurnal tide and this is a mixed tide so what is the question asking west coast of india the answer will be mixed tides the west coast of india it encounters mixed tides let us see why so if we uh, consider this map and the question is now being asked about the western coast so if you look at this map you will find that the morphology of the eastern coast region and the western coast region this coast over here this coast is narrower this area is narrower this is wider this is wider this is narrower plus the coast of the western side of india it is a submergent coast height also varies as a result due to these changes what are the changes uh, what are the differences first of all this region is narrow narrower than the eastern coast then difference in the heights and most of the times the uh, the steepness is also there is very steep the western coast of india it is steeper than the eastern coast so these three they contribute to semi diurnal tides but they are not of equal magnitude so this becomes a mixed tides so the western coast of india it encounters mixed tides while the eastern coast of india it encounters semi diurnal tides so two tides two highs and two lows of equal magnitudes okay all right now in the tropical ocean which of the following cannot so you have to read the questions very very carefully cannot increase the mixed layer thickness winds solar heating wave height and evaporation so we all know that the winds wave height and evaporation are important for the thickness of mixed layer and what cannot increase is the solar heating so it's a very simple question uh, when you read about the ocean water stratification you will come to know of the various reasons that cause the variation in the Uh, thickness of mixed layer the depth of thermocline and among them solar heating cannot increase the mixed layer thickness okay all right let us move ahead el nino southern oscillation enso is an oceanic process atmospheric process ocean atmospheric process ocean atmosphere land process so what will be the answer to this it will be ocean atmosphere process we all should know that in the oceans uh, uh, when we read about the oceanography and their inter interaction of oceans with the uh, climatic or atmospheric processes we call them the ocean atmosphere linkage means both are Uh, affecting each other so when we look at the uh, enso or el nino southern oscillation so let us have a quick uh, view of what happens let imagine that this is equator el nino normally is a phenomena specifically for the pacific ocean so what happens is that under the circumstances when the trade winds they become weak when the trade winds they become weak then on the coast of peru and chile the upwelling which was happening it stops okay this upwelling it stops by the humboldt current and so what happens here is that two things are happening first one the diminishing of trade winds and the stop of the upwelling so the trade wind they are atmospheric phenomena and the upwelling it is an ocean phenomena so therefore the correct answer would be the ocean atmospheric 
process don't get confused about the land it is not the answer the correct answer will be ocean atmospheric process we'll go in uh, detail about the enso in later questions there are a few more questions on enso so i'll tell you what happens over there but this is just to tell you how this is an ocean atmosphere atmo ocean atmospheric process trade wind involvement and the upwelling so these two they result uh, into the enso let us go to the next question roughly 11000 years from now when the earth will be at perihelion there will be summer in the northern hemisphere in december summer in the southern hemisphere in december winter in the northern hemisphere in december no change in climate from today in both northern and southern hemispheres what will be the answer answer would be summer in northern hemisphere in december let us see why so in the first question if you remember i had uh, told you about the milankovitch cycle so this is now the time has come to apply that so in this question you basically have to apply the concept of precision cycle how so let us first draw the orbit of the earth if this is the orbit of the earth this is the sun now according to the kepler's law the uh, planets they have elliptical orbit with sun at one of the focus of the ellipse and this is the earth earth has various positions so what are the positions of the earth earth is having a position of aphelion and perihelion so aphelion is the one when the earth is farthest from the sun sabse zyada dur hota earth is farthest from the sun and perihelion is the position when the earth is closest to the sun so to remember this you remember this word peri peri means near the periphery and ap means away from the periphery so under normal circumstances if this is the tilt of the earth so you can see here that earth is at aphelion in the month of june while it is at perihelion in the month of december in a way this is good because during the month of june which is which is the summer month the northern hemisphere though it is facing the sun but it is farthest from the sun as a result we have milder summers and during winters when the northern hemisphere is facing away from the sun it is closer to the sun so we have milder summers now you you, you can say sir itna garmi padta hai the temperature is so high and during winters the temperatures are so low but you should realize that those are still milder okay now question says what does the question say that roughly 11000 years from now so if we now consider the if we now consider the precision cycle and see what will happen after 11000 years so if you remember the precision cycle is of 20 kilo years it is asking about half of it so let us say if right now this is the direction of the uh, axis of the earth after half of precision cycle it may wobble it may wobble to this position okay so if the precision cycle half of after 11 kilo years 11000 years now so what will happen if let us say this is the sun and this is the earth but now the axis is in this, this direction so at the aphelion in june the northern hemisphere is facing away from the sun as a result it will be having colder climate while during the perihelion when the northern hemisphere is facing towards the sun then in the month of december so the northern hemisphere will suffer 
warm climate or summers now you can understand one thing that when the northern hemisphere is when the northern hemisphere is towards the sun during its closest position during the perihelion then now the summers will be extreme they will be very very hot summers because sun is closer to the earth and the northern hemisphere is facing the sun okay so after 11000 years the uh, due to the change in the position of the earth's axis the northern hemisphere will have summers in the month of december at perihelion and see this is the question okay let us move ahead now atmosphere of planet mars is almost entirely made up of carbon dioxide but the surface temperature of mars is less than that of the earth because co2 does not act as a greenhouse gas in absence of other gases of absence of ozone of absence of volcanic activity mars has a larger orbit than that of the earth it's a very simple question for the surface temperature greenhouse effect is not the only reason its closeness to the sun the time taken by the uh, planet to revolve around the sun are also very important so the correct answer would be the fourth mars has a larger orbit than that of the earth and it's very obvious mercury venus earth mars so mars is the fourth planet uh, from starting from mercury and thus we again understand that it has a larger orbit than the earth so it will be having a a uh, lower surface temperature than the earth okay next question the correct match of items in the list 1 and 2 is it's a very very easy question i hope nobody will do it wrong so let us see isobar isobar are the locations where equal pressure is there then so as so now we have two options One and three, in which A S is given. Iso heights, iso heights. It is the places which are having equal precipitation. Isotherm, equal temperature. So, isotherm. So, if you let us say you do not know what are iso heights, definitely you can understand what are isotherms. Therms means temperature. Iso means equal. So now we have iso bar equal pressure, iso therm equal temperature. A S C is P. Now of the two options which we had pointed out, here it is written C S Q. So this is wrong. Therefore, this one is correct. Now what is B? B is iso heights is equal precipitation and iso crons equal H. So the correct answer is one. So this is how. Even if you do not know all the options, but if you have some idea about one or two options, you can uh, reach to the correct answer. All right. It's a very interesting question. Which one? Of, which one of the following minerals in the Mohs scale of hardness is a silicate? So if you remember the Mohs scale of hardness, what does it tell you? It's the Mohs scale of relative hardness or scratch hardness. It's not an absolute scale. now if you look at it there are several minerals which are put it in put in the uh, mohs scale of hardness and the correct answer for this would be topaz let us now look at the mohs scale of hardness first mineral talc talc is a silicate you can see here mg3si4o10oh2 second is gypsum which is a sulfate it's a hydrous sulfate okay third one is calcite it's a carbonate fluorite it's calcium fluoride so it's a fluoride mineral next is apatite which is a phosphatic mineral then comes feldspar which is aluminosilicate then comes quartz which is silica topaz is silicate corundum sorry corundum is oxide and diamond is simply carbon so i have given the formula of all these minerals this is a very easy question which you should not do wrong if you just learn these names by heart and you need not learn the formula you simply have to learn whether they are silicate or non silicates okay so this is how you can uh, get this question right which of the following is not a plate boundary 
it's a very interesting question and uh, i will spend some more time on this question but first let let's look at the options carlsberg ridge southeast indian ridge east pacific rise and 90 east ridge and those of you who are familiar with now what uh, knowledge you have to apply to answer this question you have to apply your knowledge of plate tectonics as well as the stratigraphy of india so correct answer is 90 east ridge and how let us now look at this diagrams which i have uh, put up over here to show the position so this is this is the 90 degree east ridge it is called as 90 degree east ridge because it is nearly parallel to the 90 degree meridian this is not a plate margin it's not a plate boundary we'll see why but before that let us look at this Carlsberg ridge this is the Carlsberg ridge you can see here that there are scratch marks of plate being separated opening up so you can see here how this indo-australian plate is separating from the african plate so this is the direction of the motion so this is Carlsberg ridge see this is Carlsberg ridge it is a plate margin this ridge over here if you see over here this is the southeast indian uh, southeast indian ridge so the southeast indian ridge is again a plate boundary between the australian plate and the antarctic plate okay and if you look at the east pacific rise starting from the gulf of california this is the east pacific rise it separates the north american plate from the pacific plate so this is how the direction goes this is the location and the basic idea so this is the east pacific rise so this is the basic idea about the uh, options which has asked but now let us see why 90 degree east ridge is not a plate margin let us look at these four diagrams of look at the time uh, which is written over here 200 million years so you all i am sure you all un understand that this is the gondwana gondwana supergroup or the gondwana land not supergroup gondwana land so you can see here south america africa madagascar india australia and antarctica we all know that this was the time period when this uh, assembly of land masses was the supercontinent gondwana land and apart, uh, thereafter it slowly started to dismember or break apart at 85 million years the indian plate started to move move where towards north the, what were the reasons there were several reasons which included the but the most common reason was the uh, volcanism the plume activities Till now, till this time period, there is no mention of the 90 degree east ridge. Can you see? It's not there at all. The 90 degree east ridge is not there uh, in the map. But when the Indian plate started to move, see, we are now looking at a trail. We are now looking at a trail this red colored trail over here and slowly when was this at 65 ma means the uh, deccan volcanism times okay so it was the end of cretaceous when the deccan volcanic province was formed you can see here in the map so as it moved northward now you can see this 90 degree east ridge which was formed so people believe that the 90 degree east ridge was formed as the result of the northward movement of india which is very evident through these four pictures okay so the correct answer for this question would be 90 east ridge it's not a plate boundary rest all of them are plate boundaries all right next is a very very easy question and therefore solving this question uh, you should know the 
basic idea about the Kepler's law of planetary motions. So let us read what is the question Kepler's laws. Which one of the following is situated at one of the foci of orbit of Mars? So what it is asking about which is situated at the focus of the orbit of Mars? Sun, Venus, Mercury, Jupiter. Correct answer would be Sun. So according to Kepler's law, the first law of Kepler, uh, it says that all the planets, they have elliptical orbits around the Sun with Sun at one of the focus of the ellipse. Therefore, you should know that this is the correct answer. Next, the highest features on a flood plane are point bar, meander scrolls, back swamps, natural levees. I am sure you all know what is a flood plane. So, if this is a river channel, if this is a river channel and uh, this is the flood plane. So, as this water starts rising in the river channel, then what is formed over here? They are the natural levees. Have a look at this diagram. So, as the uh, flood stage water level, you know, it starts to rise during the flood. Now, what will happen? As the water rises, it will keep on bringing the coarser sediments being deposited on these two margins on the flood plane. And after several floods, these natural levees are built, which are the highest point, which are the highest point on the flood plane. So this is entire. So this whole portion is the flood plane. This is the flood plane. But what is the highest point? The natural levees. So the question says highest features on flood plane are the answer would be natural levees. These are very uh, easy questions which you should not do wrong if you have the concepts. Alright, let us look at this question. It's a very interesting question. Higher rate of silicate weathering leads to increase in CO2 in the atmosphere, decrease in CO2 in the atmosphere, increase in O2 in the atmosphere and decrease in moisture content in the atmosphere. The correct answer would be decrease in the CO2 in atmosphere. How? How does the intense silicate weathering Re, uh, lead to a decrease in CO2 in the atmosphere. Let us imagine, so before the emergence of Himalayas, when the Himalayas were not there, then the CO2 content of the atmosphere was very high. But did you know that when the Himalayas were formed, after some time of its formation, there was a sudden drop in the global temperatures. Cooling happened. It's a very interesting fact that Himalayas which were formed led to global cooling. How? So, the rocks of which the Himalayas was formed, they suddenly were exposed for the chemical weathering. Now, we all know that in chemical weathering what happens? H2O plus CO2, it forms carbonic acid H2CO3 and it leads to weathering of these rocks. Now, when suddenly a whole new set of rocks were uh, present for the chemical weathering, then large amount of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere was being used up. As a result, the atmospheric CO2, it decreased and we all know that carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas. So, as and when the carbon dioxide it uh, reduced in the atmosphere, what did it do? It led to a drop in the greenhouse effect and global cooling happened. So, higher rate of silicate weathering will cause decrease in the atmospheric CO2. Okay. All right. Next question, if the sun were to lose some mass, then duration of an year on the earth would be, it's a very easy but a very logical question, you have to apply some brains. So, what will be the duration of an year when the sun loses some mass? So, year on the earth would be longer with the length of the day being the same. 
year on the earth will be shorter with the length of the day being the same year on the earth would be of same length and the length of the day being larger and year on the earth of same length the length of the day being shorter to understand this first i'll not tell the answer now first let us look at a few things to answer this question so we have two time durations on the earth due to its two types of uh, motions one is the spin of the earth which we commonly say rotation of the earth so the rotation of the earth around the sun and second one is the revolution of the earth around the sun these are two different phenomena so the rotation it happens on its own axis and it gives us 24 hours or one day okay while the revolution is around the sun around the sun in the orbit in the orbit so this elliptical orbit of the earth so if this is the sun and this is the earth so this elliptical orbit will give us what we call as one year now imagine that the mass of the sun is capital m and that of the earth is a small m so apply the uh, gravitational force formula f is equal to g m m upon r square where r is the distance between earth and the sun now imagine that if the sun becomes a little smaller or loses some mass and its mass now becomes m dash so m is more than m dash it means that f dash which is equal to g m dash m upon r square so apart from the uh, uh, sun losing its mass all the other parameters remain the same so now you can very well imagine that f dash will be less than f so this pull of the earth and pull between the earth and the sun will reduce as a result this orbit may become a little longer so as this orbit becomes longer it will take more time to go around the sun and therefore what will happen the length of the year or duration will be longer but since the spin of the earth is Uh, the same it is not changing the uh, parameters of earth are not changing therefore the length of the day will not change the length of the day will depend specifically on the earth and its axial parameters not the orbital parameters understood so if the sun loses some mass then the duration of the year on the earth becomes more it becomes longer more than 365 days All right. Next question: Which of the following is not a part of the oceanic subtropical gyre? Oceanic subtropical gyre. So, if we look at the ocean gyres, then we know that in the uh, oceans, their gyres are formed. In the Pacific Ocean, we have the North Pacific and South Pacific gyre. In the Atlantic Ocean, we have the North Atlantic and South Atlantic gyre. While in the Indian Ocean, we have the Indian Ocean gyre. when we look at these four currents gulf stream kuroshio current and north equatorial current all these three they are tropical and subtropical currents they are all warm currents they are all warm currents while antarctic circumpolar current it is a cold current and it is a polar current so it is not a part of the not a part of the oceanic subtropical gyre let me show you how the different gyres are formed so in the pacific ocean this is the north pacific this is the north equatorial current this is the north equatorial current this is the gulf stream this is the sorry this is the pacific ocean i'm, I'm so sorry this is the kuroshio current this is the kuroshio current this is the north pacific current and then we have here 
the California current. So this becomes the North Pacific gyre. When we look at the South Pacific, we have the equatorial current called as the South equatorial current. Then this is the East Australian current. Now comes the Antarctic circumpolar current and then we have here the Humboldt current or Peru current. So this becomes South Pacific gyre. When we now look at the Atlantic Ocean, Northern Atlantic, again we have the North Equatorial Current, then we have the Gulf Stream, we have the, this is called as the North Atlantic Current and then we have what is called as the Canary Current. So this is the North Atlantic Gyre, while in the Southern Atlantic there is the South Equatorial Current, then this is the Brazil Current. Again, we get the Antarctic Circumpolar Current and then we have the Benguela Current. Benguela Current. So, this is the Southern Atlantic Gyre. And in the Indian Ocean, we have only one Gyre that too because the Indian Ocean does not have its Northern counterpart. So, the Indian Ocean Gyre has South Equatorial Current. We have the Agulas Current. We have the North, uh, sorry, we have the Antarctic Circumpolar Current and we have the West Australian current. So these are the four different type of gyres and in this you can see that the Antarctic Circumpolar Current, Antarctic Circumpolar Current is not a part of the subtropical gyres. Okay, let us move ahead. The order of molar abundance in the sea water is, so what does it say that which of these ions are uh, in the higher abundance in the sea water, if you re, uh, go through the constituents of uh, the sea water or the ocean water salinity, you will come to know that the chlorides are the highest followed by sodium, then magnesium and then sulphate. This is what you need to remember. The molar order of molar abundance. So the most abundant are the chloride ions followed by sodium followed by magnesium and then the sulphate ions. It's an easy question, but you should remember this in information. Related to the same, the residence time of the elements magnesium, calcium, strontium and barium in the sea water is in the sequence. So here it is asking about the, uh, the elements which have the highest residence time. Now when we say, when we talk about the residence time, then on what factors does the residence time depend? The residence time depends on what is the use how of a certain element. How much is it being going to use? If it is an element which is used immediately, then it will have a lower residence time. And if it is uh, being used you know, slowly it will be having a higher residence time and if it is not at all used, it will be having the highest residence time. So on that basis, the elements are divided into three categories. The elements are divided into three categories. So let me write over here. First one is just called as bio limiting elements what are bio limiting elements the bio limiting elements are those elements which are used up by the biota like phytoplanktons or zooplanktons to build up their cells tissues so the bio limiting elements are those which will be having the lowest residence time there are only three known bio limiting elements what are they the phosphorus nitrogen and silicon so these three are biolimiting elements. They are immediately used up in the oceans. So they will be having the lowest residence time. Second one, the second group is of bio intermediate. Bio intermediate. So what are bio intermediate elements? The, those elements which exert some role in the biological activities, but not as much as the biolimiting elements. So there are four known bio-intermediate elements. 
what are they there are four bio intermediate they are calcium carbon barium barium and radium so we have these four bio intermediate elements calcium carbon barium and radium and the third one is the bio unlimited means these are those elements which are present in the sea water but they do not have any major role or no role in the biological activities as a result they will be having the longest residence time and a few examples very common examples are sodium potassium rubidium uh, cesium magnesium strontium sulfur fluorine chlorine etc so if we go by this information then since calcium barium these two they are the bio intermediate elements and mg and sr they are the bio unlimited elements the correct option will be this the residence time of magnesium will be higher than strontium which will be higher than calcium which will be higher than barium okay to read more about this you should uh, read the book chemical oceanography by valley broker it's a very very nice book and it should give you a lot of insight and concepts on the chemical oceanographies it's an original work and a excellent book you should you all should go through this next question coral reef ecosystems are oases of life in the oceans because of their ability to sequester a lot of atmospheric co2 support a lot of biodiversity produce a lot of calcium carbonate reduce salinity significantly those of you who have been to coastal regions like andaman uh, and have done the undersea walk they must have seen these coral reefs or those of you who may or might have gone to uh, places in foreign countries and have visited such undersea walking sites you will be amazed to see the beautiful corals so what do the coral reefs do they are also called as oasis of life only because they support a lot of biodiversity let us have a look at this picture if you see this picture this is a coral reef where such beautiful corals are there and they uh, act as habitat as well as the source of food for different algae different phytoplankton zooplankton fish a lot of more of these therefore they are also called as oases of life so this is a very easy question you should not get confused biogeographically volcanic vent communities are located in mid oceanic ridges within subduction zones in the hadal depths around submarine hydrothermal springs if you know about the volcanic vents what they are they are nothing but hydro submarine hydrothermal springs which you must have heard about the black smokers so have a look at this these are the beautiful uh, pictures of the volcanic vent see this the black smokers this name is black smoker because it comes out in form of black smokes and these chimneys are formed they are submarine features and look at these tube worms so these are tube worms other you can see this what is this this is a crab what are these these are shrimp so and apart from these there are several sulfur bacteria sulfur bacteria so uh, these these are also called as volcanic vent communities means all those living organisms which live around a volcanic vent and they are located around the submarine hydrothermal springs see this this is the answer to this question okay next unlike tropical cyclones which generally weaken on experiencing landfall monsoon depressions that form over the head bay of bengal do not weaken for the following reason 
lower frictional force humid conditions over land lower sea surface temperature more overcast cloud cover condition so recently we have seen a few uh, tropical cyclones over indian subcontinent and we have heard that they created lot of havoc and brought lot of destruction but they got weakened everybody was waiting for their landfall so when the landfall happens then why the cyclones they get weaker they get weaker for several reasons first one is the friction what happens is that when the landfall occurs there are several buildings high high rises mountains trees what do they do they simply absorb the force and they weaken the winds in the cyclone if you look where the cyclones get generated when they get generated over the ocean surface there is nothing except the water it's it's open area so these uh, winds they start getting more energy they become very fierce and therefore the cyclone becomes stronger but when it falls on land so the first one is that they uh, collide with these high rises the trees mountains buildings and their speed it diminishes second one is that there is reduction in temperature means the uh, high temperature which makes the cyclones go stronger and stronger it's not there on the land because the uniform source of temperature is not available and the third one the reason for their uh, being weaker on landfall is the loss of humidity there is no moisture over land but what does this question say this question ask about the uh, monsoon depression that form over head bay of bengal and they do not weaken on experiencing landfall because of the humid conditions over land so when the humid conditions will be there over the land the uh, cyclones will not get weaker okay so for this question this is the correct answer very interesting question now in the given silicate structure comprising of a chain of silica tetrahedra the ratio of bridging to non bridging oxygen atoms is so before going to the options let us look at what are bridging and non bridging oxygens as the name suggests that the oxygen which joins two tetrahedra it will be a, so let us say this is one tetrahedra so 1 2 3 and 4 so these are the four oxygen atoms out of these four this is oxygen atom is being used to bridge or to join two tetrahedra so this becomes a bridging tetra a bridging oxygen so in this case if you see here 1 2 3 4 and 5 these are the five bridging oxygens while 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 and 8 these are non bridging oxygens understood now let us look at the options what are the options so how many we saw 1 2 3 4 and 5 and so these were the uh, bridging oxygens and eight non bridging oxygens so what are the options 1 is to 3 1 is to 5 1 is to 2 3 is to 7 are the options wrong or are we doing some mistake we are committing a mistake and what that mistake is the mistake is the mistake is that we are looking at this bridging oxygen as a whole but actually it is half shared by this tetrahedra 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 and half shared by this tetrahedra so this one which is you are seeing here it is actually half bridging oxygen and this one is also actually half bridging oxygen so how many bridging oxygens are we seeing here so we are having half plus this full one plus this full one plus this full one plus this half so how much does it become it becomes four bridging oxygens not five bridging oxygens so now the ratio of bridging to non bridging so how many bridging oxygens we had we had four 
and how many non bridging we had 8 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 and 8 so bridging oxygen to non bridging oxygen it would be 4 is to 8 answer would be 1 is to 2 okay many of the time people will get confused if they will not consider this not consider this as half and this as half then you will realize array answer option to say the the options are not given correct okay so keep it in mind that this is half all right it's an easy question a bit tricky all right now this question is about the resistivity log of a hydrocarbon bearing sedimentary formation so this is a sedimentary formation a and this is the resistivity log so the what is the unit of resistivity log ohm meter so this is let me write over here resistivity log okay the resistivity log of a hydrocarbon bearing sedimentary formation a revealed response as shown in b okay so let us now see what the responses are we have four peaks over here the spikes in curve b are correlated with the occurrence of 1 2 so all right so we have four peaks 1 2 3 and 4 if you look at the options what are the options given fresh water saline water oil and gas and those of you who have read about the petroleum geology they must be knowing that gas has the highest resistivity followed by oil followed by fresh water and then the sea water saline water why because saline water has lot of these ions so it is more conducting rather than resistive so if we look here spike one which is the largest spike it shows gas followed by oil followed by sea water because this is the smallest peak followed by the fresh water so gas oil sea water and fresh water and let us see gas oil sea water and fresh water correct option is third one it's a very easy question apply whatever you have read in your msc classes and you'll be easily able to do these questions all right next question a change in the channel pattern from meandering to braided in pattern implies a sudden increase in discharge increase in sediment load decrease in channel gradient decrease in width depth ratio so what happens when a channel meanders if this is the flow then this portion what it will do it will weather and this portion it will deposit this portion it will deposit but how does a braided channel form so these are braided bars braided bars so increase in the sediment load will cause a meandering channel to form the uh, braided pattern let us look at this diagram in this one you can see that this is a simple bar and here you are finding the channel is meandering channel but as the sediment load increases what does it do it starts to cover the areas and shifts the flow of the uh, water as a result the braided channel is formed from a meandering channel so the correct option would be increase in the sediment load okay all right the critical erosion velocity of sand is higher than silt and clay silt and clay is higher than sand sand is higher than pebbles pebbles is higher than cobbles what is it is asking about the critical erosion velocity very very important question when you talk when you uh, study the basics of sedimentology in the aqueous flows you come across a very important diagram called as Julestrom's diagram some people call it Hullstrom or Julestrom it's okay 
Julestrom diagram and what does this diagram tell I'll just show you but the correct answer here will be silt and clay is higher than sand why does this happen have a look at this Julestrom's diagram here it shows that the mean or critical erosion velocity curve for clay is the highest followed by silt and then sand why does this happen we all are aware that the silt the clay is finest so the cohesion between the among the particles is very high as a result it will require a larger speed larger velocity of the uh, eroding or the weathering uh, media to carry it because sands are coarser they are looser so they will require lesser speed but it is only about the erosion erosion because once they get eroded from their place the transportation of the uh, clay particles will need lesser speed because they are lighter but the critical erosion velocity will be more for clay followed by silt and then the sand understood so you should keep in mind this diagram it will help you for so many things uh, in geology all right next one one of the following probable effects will not be observed under rising sea level you should read the question very carefully will not be observed under rising sea level so when the sea level rises what will happen let us look at the options estuaries and lagoons will widen and deepen extenuated development of transgressive dune formation delta progradation spread of living coral or acceleration of coral growth so keep these two words in mind rising sea level and not be observed of course when the sea level rises the shrews and lagoon will become wider and they will become deeper there will be transgressive dune formation and the rise in sea level will cause the formation of a larger space for living and therefore living corals will grow very rapidly so what will not happen will be the delta progradation let us see how does a delta prograde if you look here let us say that this is the show sorry let us say that this is the shoreline this is the shoreline and what is a delta delta is where the sea uh, the where the river falls into the sea now imagine that this is how here this is the river which is now emptying its load into the sea and this is the sea level so this is sea level 1 now let us look at if the water level drops then what will happen let us say that this is the so if this was sea level 1 that this was the shoreline if the sea level drops it becomes over sea level 2 then now this shoreline is here it means that the river can now come up till here what does this mean that if the delta was here now the delta will progress it will go forward so we'll get deposits like this so this is the progressing delta when when does this happen when the sea level drops but now imagine imagine that the sea level rises this becomes the sea level 3 so now the shoreline is here the same river will now stop here now what will happen the delta will retrograde it will go back so the answer to this question what was the question question was will not be observed under rising sea level delta progradation will not be observed what will be there it will be delta retrogradation because when the sea level rises the shore line starts shifting landward okay all right identify the biomes so if you look at this diagram this diagram shows you a few things that temperature goes from cold to warm and the uh, humidity goes from drier to wetter so under such circumstances the correct option will be 4 tundra a will be tundra where the temperatures are extremely cold and it ranges from dry to wetter conditions followed by taiga followed by now what is c c c this 
C would definitely be a desert. Can we see any options of C as desert? No, it's saying deciduous forest, which is wrong. It's not deciduous. C has to be a desert because the temperatures are higher and it is completely dry. D, D will be where the temperatures are warmer and uh, the uh, the water availability is not very high and not very low so you will not get high rises rather you will be getting grasslands and E is deciduous forest because we are now increasing the moisture content and what would F have been? It would have been rainforest. Rainforest. Okay. So the correct option is fourth one that A is tundra, B is taiga. C, if it would have asked, it would have been a desert. D is grassland, E is deciduous forest, and F is rainforest. Okay, remember this diagram. You can see here tundra. So all the, all these are the purple colored are tundra, then taiga. So taiga is always at a lower latitude than tundra. Remember that. Okay, followed by the grasslands. You can see here the so mid latitude grasslands followed by the uh, deciduous forests so these orange portion they are deciduous forests and then the tropical rainforest if you remember this diagram you will never get this question wrong all right okay the high surface salinity in the tropical oceans is due to reduced precipitation under warm and dry air mass increased evaporation under cold and dry air mass, advection of high salinity water mass from tropical region, advection of high salinity water mass from subpolar region. To answer this question, you should remember, so let me, you should remember the wind circulation pattern. Let me draw for you. This is, if this is the northern hemisphere, if this is the equator, this is 30 degrees. This is 60 degrees. So what it was asking about, asking about this region, the subtropical. So what, if you remember the wind belts of the earth, we have this rising air followed by the air moving northward or poleward, sinking air and then returning air. This is the headless cell and this is the feral cell. Now, if you look at this portion, in the subtropical region, the air which sinks, it is dry, it is cold. So it is a very, very heavy air mass. Now, if this is the, uh, I hope you understood that part. You, you can revisit that uh, portion if you wish to see it again. So what will happen when the air mass is cold, and dry what it will do it will increase the evaporation okay and therefore when the evaporation is higher the surface salinity becomes high okay so the correct answer will be increased evaporation under the cold and dry air mass you have to apply your concept of uh, wind circulation pattern wind belts of the earth and the evaporation in the oceans okay let us move ahead. Which one of the following process does not happen during an El Nino event? So the question of El Nino came again. As I had told you in the very beginning that we'll discuss what is El Nino. We'll have a quick look at El Nino over here. So let us first look at the options. High sea level in the eastern. So what is it is asking about does not happen. Keep that in mind. Does not happen. What are they? High sea level in the eastern equatorial Pacific compared to the west. Shallow thermocline in the eastern equatorial Pacific compared to the west. Relaxation of easterly trade winds in the equatorial Pacific. Relaxation, eastward propagation of equatorial Kelvin wave. So, first let us look at what is happening in during El Nino. El Nino is a phenomenon as I had already told you that it's specific to the Pacific Ocean. So let us look at a block diagram. If this is the equator and this is South America and this is Australia, Australia, 
this is South America. Now what happens during El Nino? There are two phenomena, El Nino and La Nina. We'll talk only about El Nino here. You can read a lot about it on internet. There are several things given. During El Nino, the trade winds, they become weak. Okay. So the trade winds become weak. They weaken. As a result, when the trade winds become weak, the north equatorial current which was very strong previously, it also, not north equatorial current, both north equatorial as well as south equatorial. Just hold on. Both the north equatorial and south equatorial currents they become weaker as a result what will happen is that the warm water pool which was present in the western pacific which we called as the western pacific warm pool it will slowly start to flow towards the eastern pacific ocean it means that the warm water will flow towards the eastern pacific what it will do it will make the entire pacific ocean warm in during the la nina condition during the la nina condition the trade winds were stronger as a result the western pacific warm pool was restricted towards the western side so the western pacific ocean was very very uh, the western pacific ocean was you know warmer and the eastern pacific ocean was relatively cooler as a result the uh, you know also the stronger trade winds would have caused the uh, divergence of surface water away from the coast and it it started to cause the upwelling but now when the surface water during the El Nino conditions, they are not being removed. There was, it wasn't being removed. Then what would happen? Let us look at this. So during El Nino condition, due to this move eastward movement of warm water, the mixed layer, the mixed layer in the eastern equatorial Pacific would be thicker. As this mixed layer thickness increases, what it will do? It will push. It will push the thermocline deeper. So, during the El Nino, the thermocline is deep in the eastern equatorial Pacific while the mixed layer is thick. So, what will happen is that as a result, the thermocline in the eastern equatorial pacific will be deeper than the western pacific okay so this is this line is the thermocline line while during la nina condition when the upwelling happens the mixed layer it becomes thin and the thermocline shifts up shifts up ye upar chala jata hai. so if we look at the question what is the question asking question is saying does not happen during El Nino. So high sea level in the eastern equatorial Pacific compared to west. Yes, of course, because the water of uh, western Pacific warm pool, it flows towards eastern equatorial Pacific. Therefore, sea level be, will be higher. It is. It happens. Shallow thermocline in the eastern equatorial Pacific compared to the west. Just now we discussed that the thermocline will not be shallow. It will, it will be deeper. Why? It will be deeper because now the mixed layer has become thicker. Once the mixed layer becomes thick, it pushes the thermocline down. Therefore, this will be the correct answer for this question that thermocline will not become shallow. It will become deep. Understood? Alright. Rest of the answers are correct. Let us move ahead. Which one of the following carries low salinity waters? 
northward to, uh, to answer this question you have to apply your knowledge about the Coriolis force about the uh, coastal currents of India and about the winds changing wind patterns uh, during the monsoonal season so let us look at the answers uh, options first which one of the following current carries low salinity water northward so you should understand that the Bay of Bengal is you know is less saline than the Arabian Sea you all know the reason why if you do not know put a question in the comment section and I will answer this to you that the salinity of Bay of Bengal is lower than the uh, Arabian Sea now the question is asking low salinity waters northward so what will happen during this uh, what will how this phenomena will be caused the correct option will be west india coastal current during winter let us see how look at this map in this map you can see the two water bodies the bay of bengal and the arabian sea so the two currents namely the west india coastal current and east india coastal current these are two coastal currents which are the local currents and they uh, run throughout the year but they are under the effect of the monsoonal winds so when the southwest monsoon comes the summer monsoon what it does this is the direction of west india coastal current and this is the direction of east india coastal current i am sure you understand why because if the winds are moving towards this way so if this is the wind direction the coriolis effect will cause the right deflection and here they move like this but when the uh, winter monsoon comes then what will happen when the winter monsoon or the so just a point I forgot that during the summer monsoon the higher salinity water will be carried this way okay but when the winter monsoon comes then what will happen when the winter monsoon comes, the East India coastal current will reverse. So what it will do? It will carry the lower salinity Bay of Bengal waters and gives it across this portion and the West India coastal current will carry the low salinity waters towards the north. Okay, understood this? Now, see the options. East India coastal current during summer so it is asking about the low salinity water northward now if you remember during the summer season was it the east india coastal current uh, carrying the low salinity water no because it was the high salinity water which was coming from the arabian sea east india coastal current during winter we just saw that east india coastal current carries low salinity water southward not northward in this diagram you can see east india coastal current is carrying the low salinity water southward during the winter monsoon west india coastal current during summer we saw that the west india coastal current was carrying the high salinity water southward and then the west india coastal current during winter yes the west india coastal current will carry the low salinity bay of bengal waters northward so the correct option will be west india coastal current during winters all right oceanic subtropical gyres are driven by so again a question on uh, the subtropical gyres if you remember so the subtropical gyres they what what do they help uh, how are they operating the subtropical gyres they operate with the help of equatorial easterly and subtropical westerly winds equatorial westerly and subtropical easterly winds subtropical westerly and polar easterly winds and subtropical easterly and polar westerly winds so when we 
talk about the subtropical gyres then the polar currents the polar winds are not there now let us look at the first two options equatorial easterly and subtropical westerly or equatorial westerly and subtropical easterly winds guys remember i'll just give you one idea what are westerly winds <coughs> sorry about that what are westerly winds remember winds which start from west and go towards east those winds which start from west and go towards the east they are called as westerly winds and what are easterly winds easterly winds they start from east and go towards west so the equatorial region where the winds they come from east and go towards west they will be called as equatorial easterly winds while those which come uh, you know in the subtropical regions they start from west and go towards east they become westerly winds so the correct option will be a that is equatorial easterly and subtropical westerly winds these are very important for the formation of subtropical gyres the delta 18 or record obtained from surface dwelling planktic foraminifera for the holocene interval from a sediment core from northern bay of bengal would mainly reflect now few things which you should take care over here what it is asking first of all delta 18o then surface dwelling planktic forams for the holocene from northern bay of bengal okay so you should know what are the factors that cause variation in delta 18o you know, most specifically it is the temperature salinity and the vital effects but in this case since we are talking about the planktic foraminifera from holocene interval the correct option will be sea surface salinity changes this is the most appropriate option okay go read about the stable isotopes there is a very good book uh, proxies in cenozoic paleoceanography you should read the chapter on stable oxygen and carbon isotopes and then you will this topic needs a uh, great detail so it's not really possible to discuss in detail over here but i have made a video on the uses of stable isotopes if you wish to see that you can get a basic idea and then if you demand i will uh, devote one class only on the delta 18o of the foraminifera let us move ahead Marine sedimentary and ice core record reveals that earth has undergone several phases of glacial interglacial intervals in the geological past which are not true in this context okay now what it is talking about glacial interglacial intervals and which is not true so the present interglacial period holocene is marked by several cooling periods with known cyclicity it is absolutely true yes there are cyclicity in the several a uh, cooling events which are known okay so this is the correct thing in the late quaternary the glacial interglacial cyclicity changed from 41000 years to 100000 years yes absolutely correct if you look at uh, the stable oxygen isotope records you will see that the peaks the amplitude of those uh, you know spikes it has increased to a cyclicity of 100000 years so it is also correct in the late quaternary the glacial intervals were very long as compared to interglacial intervals so if we talk the late quarter and the it means that we are talking about the late pleistocene holocene time period and yes there are uh, there have been the records of some glacial events which were really very very long and then the fourth option is glacial interglacial intervals have always been of equal duration and have the same periodicity in all geological time intervals so by logic if this is the third option is correct then the fourth one is wrong but yes fourth one is not true so this is the correct answer over here that we'll see a question on various cooling events of the late cenozoic and then there you would come to know about the timings okay so you should know that the glacial interval glacial periods are not of equal duration okay all right next which of the following statement is correct with regard to upwelling in the oceans in the equatorial region there is no upwelling because the coriolis effect is zero at equator upwelling occurs in all the coastal areas of the uh, world oceans upwelling intensity is maximum at the peruvian margin in the pacific during el nino events 
upwelling occurs in equatorial region due to equatorial divergence to answer this question you should understand you should you know remember the concept of coriolis effect the wind divergence wind convergence ocean divergence so let us say if this is the equator at the equator we know approximately the trade winds they converge so these are the two trade winds this is the north east trades and these are the south east trades so if you remember the concept of coriolis effect as these trade winds they are coming towards equator what they will do they will cause the ocean water to deflect towards right and left respectively in the two hemispheres as a result the equatorial region it suffers is you know vacant space or blank space yahan par jagah khali ho jati hai because the equatorial divergence caused by the convergence of winds it leads to the formation of space when this space is created over here upwelling will happen so the correct option is fourth one that upwelling occurs in equatorial region due to equatorial divergence okay you should uh, understand this concept next which one of the following sequences of paleoclimatic events is correct from old to young during the quaternary now see we have these several paleoclimatic events this we just did a question on the uh, cooling events now let us look at this elrod bowling younger dryas lgm bond events lgm elrod bowling younger dryas bond events bond events younger dryas elrod bowling lgm lgm younger dryas bond events elrod bowling now this is something which you need to remember you, i have given a table also uh, for this question you will just go through it but the correct answer will be lgm elrod bowling younger dryas and bond events so this is older to younger now look at this table northern hemisphere glaciation 3 to 2.4 million years ago lgm last glacial maximum 90 to 20 kilo years ago bowling warming 14.7 kilo years ago older dryas 14 kilo years ago elrod warming 12.7 kilo years ago younger dryas 11 to 10 ky and bond events after 10 kilo years so you should remember these few names along with their uh, ages you know even the duration of their occurrence at what time in the geological past they have occurred understood so this will help you all right guys that's all for today if you like this video give your thumbs up and if you want more such lectures do write in the comment section and i will make more such videos for you but only on demand if you wish to practice more such questions from the previous year question papers do text me in the comment section have an awesome day